I'm Bo. And I'm Jamie. And this is the only podcast that dares ask the question, hey, Jamie, what you watching? You know, I've been watching a lot. Oh, well, that's good. Uh, that let's see. One makes thing the show I work did. a lot better. <laughs> yeah. I could just say nothing. No, no, nothing. <laughs> just, uh, but no, it is not the case. Um, just staring at the you, walls. You are, I assume, familiar with the film Rosemary's Baby. Oh, I am. Yeah. Uh, have you ever seen Look What's Happened to Rosemary's Baby? The sequel? I have not. Yeah. Uh, it's from 76. It was a TV movie. And I've been looking for it forever. Uh-huh. It's I For one, I have a soft spot for TV movies. I just, I do. And Brian makes fun of me for that all the time. But it's, it's a thing. I love TV horror movies. Uh-huh. Also, particularly from the 70s. And... Of course, I love Rosemary's Baby. It's one of my all-time favorite movies. As a matter of fact, last week when I was convalescing because of the COVID, I Mm -hmm. uh, watched that. It's one of my comfort movies. So, (laughs) Yeah, because it's it's such a feel-good movie. It is, yeah. In in no way uh, unsettling or... (laughs) It was a toss-up between that and The Omen. Those are two movies that I just love to watch when I'm feeling low. (laughs) I would have gone, The Omen is a little more popcorn of a movie, I feel like, you know. And you've Well, got, you do have that David Warner head cut, which is awesome. It's really good. Plus, you've got Gary Cooper like, I've got to kill my child. Yeah. Did you know, speaking of um, manly voices, did uh, you know that uh, the in the original Rosemary's Baby, there is a scene where Rosemary talked to Donald Baumgart, the actor that guy gets the part from because the guy goes because donald goes blind Mm -hmm. and there's a scene where rosemary talks to him on the phone and then i've seen this movie i don't even know how many times easily in the double digits and this time when i was watching it i'm like what is that voice i know that voice i recognize it so i looked it up it's fucking tony curtis no kidding right i was like what (laughs) i mean why i had i mean it's just I don't know, random, but yeah, it's Tony Curtis. And he was uncredited, I believe, in the original film. And then, you know, it's on IMDb, but I was like, oh. And then once I knew that, I couldn't unhear it. Like, it was obvious, but I'm like, that's so weird. (laughs) But anyway, so I looked up, I I found, um, uh, look what's, I was going to say, look who's talking. Look what's happened to Rosemary's baby. (laughs) Look who's talking to Rosemary's baby. (laughs) Look who's talking to Rosemary's baby. (laughs) Spoiler, it's the devil. I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, no, I found it on Tubi, of course. Yeah, who's, <laughs> of course, who is in Look What's Happened to Rosemary's Baby? Are any of the original cast in it? Um, yes, there's one, oh, no. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, yes, I think there was, but I want to say it was just like a flashback scene. But uh, as far as who played um, Rosemary's baby, mm-hmm. um, which is all grown now, is, um, oh, fucking, um, oh, wait, uh, Stephen McHattie. Really? Yes. And he's like in his 20s or, you know, young. And uh, I was like, what? <laughs> like, I've never seen him that young. So that's weird. Uh, Patty Duke was in it, of course. Okay. She, she was in everything. Uh, but the 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 conceit here is that he is grown. He has no idea who he is. So it's very similar to uh, Damon, uh, Om- the Omen 2, mm-hmm. where, uh, where da- Damon, Damien, where Damien finds out who he is. Only it's not that good. But, okay, sure. but and he's much older so uh, i want to say he's supposed to be like 18 and he just, just all of a sudden just evil it's it's weird i i honestly it's not good it and i was really disappointed now i had never heard that it was good mm-hmm. but i expected it to be a little better than it was and i was i was very disappointed but the cool thing about it was that there was a very young Stephen McHattie in it. Also, Broderick Crawford was in it, Ruth Gordon, and Ray Milland, and Tina Louise. So they had a lot of people in this movie, and it just 
is sad. So, and they, they go through and they're trying to get him to, you know, you, you want to do this, you want to come to this side. And he has this friend who's with him the whole time. And this friend is, um, uh, you think like supposed to be this good influence. And then it turns out that the friend is the bad influence. And then you get to the end of the movie and he ends up getting killed. And then there, I, I mean, I'm spoiling like a, 50 year old movie but uh he he ends up getting killed and then they just basically start all over again so they have a woman that they've gotten pregnant and and then they're just gonna start all over i'm like wow so you just wasted 18 years uh to not get what of course i guess it's the friggin' devil he's got eternity so 18 years is nothing but it's just like we're gonna raise this kid and then we get to this point and then you know oh now we got to reset so it was uh it was sadly disappointing yeah well um so not a strong start sorry yeah that's fine that's why it's interesting because i've never seen that and i've always been curious but now i i am even less interested to watch it uh than i was and you're doing fine you're not <laughs> you're not you're yeah. doing just yeah. fine you ain't missing much um i saw a lot of my stuff is going to be stuff that premiered on Shutter because I've really been trying to keep current with all of their original releases or kind of exclusive releases and, and so yeah. forth. And so I watched The Spine of Night. Oh, I watched that. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. So here's, uh, I thought it was imperfect because it's mm-hmm. kind of an anthology. I didn't realize that going into it, that it's kind of an anthology film. But yeah, it's it, it yeah, I mean it's it's kind of a weird like a linear anthology um like a like it tells an overarching story but there are little different time periods in there like different little vignettes. Yeah. Is what I took from it. Right. So th- I mean there's a through line of hey the, you know this is sort of Lucy Lawless having this conversation with um the Richard Grant who is the you know, sort of uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade night standing yes. vigil, you know? Yes. And, and so that part of it was really interesting. Some of the stories were kind of hit and miss, but I really dug the vibe of the movie that it just, because it's something that you don't see anymore. Right? Like it's been, what, like mid 80s since you saw an animated like an adult animated film like this that was yeah it's very heavy metal very heavy metal very uh a little bit of the like ralph bakshi lord of the rings stuff it's got a little bit of that vibe but yeah mostly like the the story from heavy metal uh that i think i think it was the last story in the original heavy metal with the lady who rode the dragons and all that stuff it like if you took that piece and expanded it out into a a feature length and it was like gory and there's lots of nudity there's less heavy metal music which is a problem but (laughs) other than that i thought it was cool I, i like i said i don't think it's a perfect movie by any stretch but i had a good time watching it and there were enough little things throughout that was like oh that's cool oh that's kind of cool um, and I, I like that whole kind of last story about the, you know, people who had the wings and the big airships that they're trying to fight, mm-hmm. mostly because that ends with everybody just like melting in lava or whatever. Uh, I thought all that stuff was pretty, uh, pretty cool. It's, it's real grim. Um, mm-hmm. And really violent too. Lots of uh, like that one scene where I think it's a scythe. They just take and just whoosh, just he slices like eight people in half at once. And uh, I was like, damn, all right. Yeah, yeah, super violent. A uh, lot, a lot of blood, a lot of nudity, a lot of you know fantasy esque kind of tropes and and so forth. I just thought it was interesting. Like I, I'm, I'm not like over the moon for the movie but i'm really glad it exists you know like i i i agree i i wish there were more like this and it it's the voice cast is really good too it's got a pretty a pretty deep bench like you know pat oswald showing up and joe mm-hmm. manganello and 
uh like i said Lu- lucy lawless and larry fessenden is is doing a voice in there and it just also really betty betty gabriel from uh walking dead has uh she has a part in there the um yeah, this is the story that that brian told me was that the this is the same guy who did love death and robots mm. from netflix and Love, Death, and Robots was supposed to be, or he had pitched it as, or he wanted it to be he- an, another heavy metal movie. Only they couldn't secure the rights to call it a heavy metal movie, and uh, like they were arguing with him about it or whatever. So he just said, fuck it, and made Love, Death, and Robots. And then this is from the same guy. So that I explain, I think explains why it's so it feels so heavy metal because that's all i kept thinking about the whole time i was watching it and i think that that's why is because he is clearly you know heavily inspired by that and loved it loved it so much he wanted to make a heavy metal movie and then when he couldn't he just said well fine i'll just do my own thing but it's going to be real damn close like, right you know? <laughs> try and stop me yeah <laughs> so I thought it was cool, and you know, I've recommended it to a couple of people with with sort of an asterisk of don't go in with measured expectations. Like this isn't going to blow your socks off, but it's really interesting. And I've had a lot of people come back and say that they really enjoyed it. In some cases, way more than I did. But it's cool. I, I just I think there was something interesting about that kind of filmmaking that you don't see anymore it's a it's a i it made me happy that it wasn't just cgi animation you know that it was like hand drawn even though it was occasionally kind of crude but i would rather see that i think than computer animation i agree you know i liked the i really liked the animation style and i don't remember the last time i've seen so many cartoon boobs and dongs yeah, that yeah. was a lot. I, I like a good cartoon dong. <laughs> I ain't above it. Uh, uh, what, what else have you been watching? Well, you know how sometimes you see a movie in the theater and you don't like it at all, mm-hmm. and then like 15 years later, you're like, "Oh, let me give that movie another shot just because." Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> you know how you do. Mm-hmm. Well, I I did that and uh, I watched. Teristas again for the first time since it came out in the theater. I, uh, all right. Let me interrupt just to say I had never seen Teristas until over the pandemic, and I watched it for the first time within the past 18 months. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, when it first came out, I didn't like it at all. I, mm-hmm. I just, I don't know what it was at the time. I just, I was just like, nope. But I watched it this time, and I didn't hate it. I actually gave it a 3.5 out of 5. And Mm -hmm. I was like, well, this is better than I remembered. And so, I, you know, that just goes to show. And Brian's like, I don't know why you're making me watch this movie. Because he didn't like it either when it first came out. I'm like, because, you know, as we age, sometimes our opinions change. Sometimes the mood changes. I mean, you know. I like to give things another shot. Like, I just, I like to be fair. And I have been deriding this film for 15 years. So I was like, let me just see. And I didn't hate it. Like, I, it was all right. You know, I, it wasn't, you know, it's not a movie that I'm going to put on my watch when I'm not feeling well list, but I didn't hate it, you know? So the, I, I bring that up simply to point out that sometimes, things are different down the road and it's worth it to give something another shot counterpoint go ahead so i watched teristas and (laughs) i thought it was uh toothless and boring (laughs) well um i thought it was boothless and touring but oh fair enough you know (laughs) i i just thought yeah i I don't even know what that means um, I guess <laughs> boothless means that you're not going to see it at a convention. <laughs> but it's touring, so it must be going around. <laughs> right, just not at conventions, just at gas stations and <laughs> bus depots. No, my big problem with Teristas was I went into it thinking like, okay, well, this is going to be a movie that capitalizes on the, you know, hostile saw torture porn kind of trend 
And as I was watching, I was like, oh, this isn't very gory at all. Also, not very interesting. I'm getting really bored because nothing's happening. And I don't like any of these characters. And I don't care about watching them creep around a shack. And I would, I would rather... I would almost rather it was like a torture porn kind of movie. Like, like say what you will about Eli Roth. And I've said a lot of raw shit about Eli Roth in my day, but at the very least he shows the goods and uh, Teresa doesn't even do that. And I watched the unrated one and I was yeah, like, so did I, this isn't all that unrated. No. Well, and what what I thought was interesting about that is the credit, the opening credits is really brutal, you know, with mm -hmm. the girl on the table and all of that. And I was like, oh, and then I, I said to myself, I was like, well, this was two south. This was 2006. So I, I was like, I didn't remember it being that brutal or that gory, but it looks like we're in for it. Mm -hmm. No, we weren't. You're, I mean, you're not wrong. We weren't. And the the biggest problem I had with it was that huge, boring exposition dump that we got from the doctor toward the end of the movie, where he goes on this long soliloquy about why he's doing the things he's doing and why he's harvesting organs and why. And I'm just, and he, he talks for like fucking 10 minutes. Like It's probably more like five, but it felt like 10 minutes. And I'm just like, this is so much, like, just so much talking from one guy with nobody else talking. It's just him going. And I'm like, that is the clumsiest delivery of what the hell is going on. But what I did, I did like the way that it was shot. I did like the scenery. I did like some of the uh, the music. So it was more the technical stuff that I guess I didn't hate. And then when we did get some gore, I thought it looked decent. But it is pretty toothless. I mean, you're absolutely right. It is one of those films that you watch it and then it just kind of flies out of your head. And I just thought it was interesting, though, because when I saw it the first time, I outright hated it. I mean, I was just like, I rem and I remember I reviewed it and it was just scathing. And just, I think I referred to it as like hostile with no balls, you know, when, mm. <laughs> which is basically what it felt like. So I was impressed with that. I enjoyed it more than that, but you're not wrong. I mean, you're absolutely not wrong. And some of the decisions that these people make are just ridiculous, but it was, like I said, better than I remembered it being. It's still not great, but, you know. And, and I'm very generous with my ratings. Uh, so a 3.5 is not really that good for me. It's, <laughs> it's a, it's like a middle of the road. Uh, because I'm, if you look at my letterbox, I got a lot of fours and fives. And I, I, I rarely land in the middle. Either I really, really like it or I'll toss it out the window. So it, for me to land in the middle, that just means you didn't do anything that pissed me off, but you also didn't excite me very much either. So, but I just thought it was kind of, um, it, at least it, it came up a little bit from the first time I watched it, but it's still not great. Oh, um, well, all right. Um, I, all right, speaking of watching old movies, let me jump to this one. So, you know how sometimes... You, you watch a movie that you haven't seen in about 20 years, and it's just as good as you remembered it. Yes. So I watched, uh, I watched War Games, and I meant to watch eh, five, ten minutes of it. Um, but then I forgot that that movie opens up with, like, Michael Madsen. And, um, who is the other guard at the beginning of war games? It's somebody else. That's like a name. And it was like, Oh my God, I forgot that these people were in it. Oh shit. Right. Dabney Coleman is all up in this movie. Oh, and there's Barry Corbin. And so I ended up watching all of war games is the moral of the story. <laughs> and I hadn't watched war games in a really long time, but I watched it a ton when I was a kid. Yeah. And it was really delightful. Like I still really enjoyed it. it. It's still a very fun movie and, you know, has something to say, makes its point. And Dabney Coleman is kind of a great bureaucratic asshole. 
Um, and the, the whole scene where he's like, hey, see out there where it says DEFCON 3? That's usually a DEFCON 4. You know why it's not a DEFCON 4? Because of you, you little prick. And that <laughs> that whole scene is really wonderful. Uh, and then the you know the end of it the whole you know playing tic-tac-toe and all the thermonuclear war simulations and stuff like that it, it, like it still totally worked for me i don't know learn how... learn yeah right <laughs> and yeah and it was it was really fun to watch a movie that i mean it's not as relevant today as it was at the time because you know well uh, i don't know maybe I we mean... circled around I, we yeah yeah but you know i mean it's not to the point we were you know? right it's, but yeah it's not the same kind of cold war vibe but it, it it in all the computer technology is just so archaic and all that but um it's still super fun and it's got good performances and matthew broderick was really charming when he was a, a young actor and ali sheedy is yeah. a lot of fun and it's just cool, you know, like I had a great time, you know, watching a movie that I remembered fondly and having that experience of like, oh, no, this is as good as I remember it. It's, you know, it's it's dated, but that's fine. It's still a good movie. Um, And it reminded me of seeing a post somewhere where somebody was talking about how they don't like to watch movies made before 1990. And I was like, really? Because, yeah, because there's like, that's most movies then. Yeah. Right. Uh, is this someone that you are friends with? No, 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 no. <laughs> it was just a random post I saw somewhere where <laughs> okay. it was it, I'm like, stop that. <laughs> yeah, no, I would have a serious talk with him. Like, you understand that <laughs> there's a, a long, long history of cinema and just because it doesn't have the quick edits of a marvel movie doesn't mean that it's not yeah. good um but yeah i thought it was uh, a lot of fun is the moral of that story is that war games is a good time and if you've never seen war games it's 40 years old and looks every bit of it but it's also kind of fun and and it was interesting like him it, matthew broderick explaining how like com computers can communicate over phone lines Right. Was like, oh, well, right. <laughs> that was that was before that was the thing. I remember seeing that movie and being like, oh, my God, one day you're going to be able to talk to people on computers. <laughs> well, that's like, did you ever see Brain Scan? Uh, uh, yeah, years the, ago. Yeah. I know what you're talking about, but yeah, a long, and long then, time like, ago. You watch the, uh, the, what's that kid? The um... Edward Furlong. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you watch in the beginning, Edward Furlong has this whole like wild, crazy computer setup, you know, that he can talk to and everything. And they're like, ooh. And that was only in the 90s. It's not like it was that long ago. Yeah. But you're like, ooh, look how fancy. <laughs> when Matthew Broderick pulls out that floppy disk that is the size of his head. Right. <laughs> and I was like, oh, right. Yeah. I forgot that that was a thing. And, you know, and it... they were actually floppy. Yeah. You know, when we got to the 3.5s, they were, you still called them floppy disks, but they weren't floppy. No. Nah. You know? No. Nah. But, uh. Not unless anyway, you took funny. the plastic off. It's funny you should, <laughs> it's funny you should mention that because, <laughs> sorry, I just had a picture of something totally different in my head. <laughs> You're filthy. And, <laughs> I am. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> uh, that feels like an old Carson bit. May your flappy disk be inserted into your disk drive. <laughs> so. <laughs> and it gets floppy once you take the plastic off. But I, uh, well, eh, kind of, yeah. Gonna say? What was I going to say? Oh, it's funny you should bring up war games because yeah. I was, I have not watched it recently, but I was going to mm -hmm. because we just watched In Search of Tomorrow, the, um, um the guys who did in search of darkness the um the horror doc uh -huh. did a, a sci-fi doc from the 80s and they went through you know year by year through the 80s and and did all the the big tent pole sci-fi movies now there were some obvious omissions that you know make you go there's going to be a sequel but it was really good 
And one of the films they highlighted was War Games. And I was just like, God, I haven't seen that movie in forever. So it's actually on my to watch at some point soon list because it watching the little doc about it made me want to see it again. So. I didn't realize they had done uh, In Search of Tomorrow. I, like, did they do two or three In Search of Darkness? There are two out currently. There is a third one on the way. And then now they've done In Search of Tomorrow. And I think there are going to be more of those as well. You know what I don't really like about those movies? Hmm. Is that they don't really say anything about the movies. It's just like, hey, remember this? And you're like, yeah. yeah, I do remember that. Well, what about this one? I, I, Yes, I remember that one too. And then <laughs> this one? Yeah, I, I do. I do remember that. But what about this? Yes, I, I remember all of this. <laughs> The and... In Search of Tomorrow one did have some cool interviews and some stories from production and things like that. So it was it was entertaining, but it does kind of suffer from the same thing. And it's more that, I mean, hell, they're kind of rushing through it, and it's still five hours long. You know, right, because, yeah. That's... You know, they go through ten years worth of movies, but... That's another problem is, like, if I'm going to dedicate three or four hours to a documentary, I want it to be something like, you know... Uh, what Woodlands Dark and Days Bewitched, something like that, where it's like, oh, there's a lot of meat on this bone. It's not just remember this movie. It's talking about how all of these movies are thematically connected, and maybe you yeah. don't think of this as folk horror, but it kind of is for these reasons, and like that kind of stuff, where it's really interesting and engaging. Whereas In Search of Darkness is a thing that I have thrown on in the background while I'm doing dishes. You know, it doesn't demand attention the way that like a real, <laughs> in quotes, a real documentary does. And you are correct. Uh, you are right. Uh, they do just kind of, you know, fly through and they are, it's their fault that I watched Full Moon High and that movie's crap. So. <laughs> Is that Alan it's, Arkin? Yes. <laughs> and it's terrible. <laughs> I was like, God damn it. I was, and I actually covered it for liking it. I was like, I've never seen this, so I'm going to do this for liking it. And then I watched it, and it was bad. It's yeah. so bad. Not even funny, just awful. I, but, um, yeah, that's how uh, every now and again I'll run into a movie on found footage fool. That I'm like, I, you know, I watch this because it's a found footage movie, and that doesn't make it like that. That's no excuse for having watched it. Did you ever watch Ghoul? It's, I have not uh, yet. No, no, no. Okay. I have not. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's not bad. I, it's not one of my favorite found footage movies or anything. But they do some interesting things as far as they bring in real life stuff. You know, they, talk, they open with um, how Stalin, you know, starved so many Ukrainians back in the day which mm -hmm. i actually appreciate when people bring up stalin because everyone's always talking about hitler but nobody ever talks about stalin and that guy was a fucking bastard he was so evil and um it, somehow hitler has managed to corner the market on evil when if you look at the just the sheer numbers now his stalin was stretched over a longer amount of time but if you just go by sheer numbers he killed a whole lot more people and he's just horrible and so when he had that he forced them into famine and they ended up turning to cannibalism like there was a huge cannibalism problem in ukraine uh, because of him and then they sort of they open with that little tidbit of information and then they bring in uh, the story of uh, chikatilo mm -hmm. who and they use him in the movie um not the real person, but they use his story in the movie. And I think that's cool. I actually like it when a found footage film goes to the trouble of working in real world stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think it's worth it for that. If, um, if nothing else. Yeah, I, I but, agree. I if, if you can lend your found footage movie an air of authenticity with some stuff like that, then I'm generally more interested. As yeah, a so I, you know, being a found footage guy, I think you should give it a shot. Um, you want to do another one? I feel like we, I uh, mean, sure. Okay. Yeah, we kind of did some. That was kind of wonky, but um, this is one that I think 
I think you'll be appreciative of, mm -hmm. as am I, because I think you're a Kenneth Branagh fan. I am a Kenneth Branagh fan. Yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. Um, we just watched Death on the Nile. Oh, I, I saw that also. <sighs> My God. I love, I love his, uh, first of all, I love him in those movies. And after um, Murder on the Orient Express came out, I felt like it didn't do all that well. And I was really sad because I wanted him to do more of them because I just feel like he is one so good at it and then so good in the role. And I was just like, uh, I was so sad. But then when I found out that death on the Nile was coming out, I'm like, Oh, nice. You know? So we watched it and I really dug it. I loved it. I, first of all, Kenneth Branagh, I just love him anyway. And I haven't seen Belfast yet, but I am really excited to, because I saw him on Bill Maher and uh, he was talking about when he was making Belfast and how that's based on his life uh, when he was in Ireland as a little boy. And so I just got really, uh, I'm really excited to see that film. But anyway, what, we watched Death on the Nile and I thought it was really, really good. I it didn't surprise me that it was because I just love him, but it looked so beautiful. It's so, it's just, it's fantastic. And the cast, I thought, was great. And I just, I don't know. I, I enjoyed that one. Did you like it? I did not. No? Why? I thought it was beautiful. I did not think the cast was great. I, I don't what? think Gal Gadot can act. Well, um, I'm, mm, she's a little stiff, but she's pretty. She is pretty, but, I you know, there's the, <laughs> one of my favorite jokes from Paula Poundstone was about uh, Daryl Hannah. Uh -huh. And she said, you know, I don't know why we still allow her to be in movies. <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with this. I think Daryl Hannah is better than Gal Gadot. But the point was, uh, I think she's pretty, but I would be fine if they just put a little picture of her in the corner of the screen and had somebody <laughs> else actually do the, the acting part of it. And <laughs> that's how <laughs> that's how I feel about gal gadot but also i just thought the cast in general was not very good oh what i like there i like kenneth brana binning and and kenneth brana and i actually i don't care uh that he had this whole like cannibal fantasy or whatever i like army or army 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 <laughs> army hammer <laughs> army hammer thank you i was trying to call him army hermer i mean army lermer what arlie adomable okay. abominable Ar Arlie Ermy and Army Hammer. I was trying to mix them up, and I was trying to say Army Ermy. I Arlie Ermy was in <laughs> Death on the Nile, even though he has <laughs> passed away several years ago. It was his death. It was that they were talking right. about. That's what they were. <laughs> I have died. <laughs> Someone find out who killed me. <laughs> Get to solving a mystery, maggots. <laughs> So I think Kenneth Branagh is as good as Hercule Poirot, um, but the whole bit with his wife, they're like, uh, there oh, are that was sad and sweet. It was sad, but like all of the exposition in this movie is so ham fisted. It like I I don't think it's well written. I don't think that the cast is, is very good. Some of them are. Like, I think Annette Benning is fine. I thought Russell Brand was good. Um, oh, my God. Do you know? I saw his name in the credits in the beginning, mm -hmm. and then I kept looking for him. And it took me forever to figure out that Russell Brand was Russell Brand. Because I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> you shouldn't tell people that. They're going to put you in a home. <laughs> <laughs> look like it, it I mean, of it, course it does it looks it exactly looks like, like russell brand because it, it looks is like him now but it didn't look like him the last time i saw him which was like i don't know saving silverman or something yeah, like, yeah. forgetting sarah marshall <laughs> oh that's right <laughs> Sa saving silverman is uh features um What's her name? Not not Piper Parabo, the other one who looks like Piper Parabo. Oh, the other one. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about? No, of course not. Um, <laughs> it's not Lake Bell, and it's not not Piper Parabo. It's the 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 other of that trifecta of actresses <laughs> that look exactly like one another. Oh, uh, like Amy Adams and um, Isla Fisher. Yeah, Isla Fisher, Isla Fisher. <laughs> Isla Fisher. <laughs> 
God, what is wrong with you? I, I, I like that you just developed an accent. <laughs> Isla Fisher? <laughs> <laughs> um, saving... Well, I'm sad that you didn't like Death on the Nile. That I, makes me sad because I loved it. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, you know. Um, Amanda Pete is who's in Saving Oh, Seven. oh, you know what? You're not wrong. Like, I know I'm not wrong. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, you put Amanda Pete, Piper Perivo, and Lake Bell in a room together, and you just shuffle them up like they change clothes, and they yeah, come yeah, out yeah. and like there's no way to tell them apart. Do like a uh, a shell game, but with them. Yeah, but with those three actresses. Um, and I like all of them is the and thing. Then combine it with whack-a-mole. So when you, you mix them up and then one of them pops up, you whack them. <laughs> a little whack a I don't know. I, it's like I'm drunk. I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> it's all right. Move on. What's your, you've, you've got COVID brain apparently. I, you know, brain fog with COVID is a real thing. Like last yeah. week, it was so hard for me to even string two thoughts together. I mean, and I know everybody out there is listening is like, when is it not? But I even the simplest tasks I was having difficulty with, like trying to to reconcile in my brain. Uh, okay, then I hit enter like that. That's mm-hmm. you know it was it was rough, but uh, so I'll blame that. That that's that's what I'll go with. Let me tell you about a another Shutter film that I watched that was also not very good. Um, this one is called See for Me. Okay, I've seen the trailer. I've not seen the film. Okay, so did you ever happen to see a Mike Flanagan movie called Hush? Well, yeah. Okay. I I know you did. I'm just... I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm setting up for the audience. Uh, imagine that movie, only instead of deaf, she's blind. And instead okay. of good, it's not. <laughs> Wait, so what was the movie? There was a blind movie. Oh, uh, Don't Breathe. That's what people were comparing Hush to when it came out. But like, because that was like year of the handicapped people yeah. fighting back, you know. Um, but okay. All right. So, it, or wait, wait Until Dark is the original version of well, all of these movies. That's a good one. Wait Until Dark's amazing. And so is Hush. Hush is a terrific movie. It's really really tense and 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 so forth i mean it's mike flanagan and right. we we all love mike flanagan here on this show but so c for me is about a a young woman played by skylar davenport and she was a a skier and ends up uh, having this like progressive ocular disease that means that she's blind now. And so she gets an app on her phone called see for me. And so she has to not has to, but she, she like, she gets locked out of this house that she's house sitting, uh, you know, for the owners. And, uh, the see for me is basically like, you open up this app, you point the phone camera at whatever it is that you need to see, and somebody on the other end, it's like a service where somebody is like, oh, I can tap into your camera and here's what you're looking at. And oh, that's kind of a disturbing premise. Well, I mean, it's handy. I, like I, when, when I saw the, the premise of this, I was like, oh, that makes sense. That's, that's kind of an interesting app. Um, well, I mean, think about this. If you're blind mm-hmm. and then you're, you have no idea what you may have no idea what you're aiming your camera at. So mm-hmm. what if it's like, what if there's a mirror there and you're naked or something like that is just, it's a recipe for possibly embarrassment and or disaster. I, I suppose that's true. That's not the, the approach that this movie took. Well, damn. <laughs> nor nor is it that the person on the other end of the app is like, hey, hey um, go go forward 15 steps. Hey, hey there's a staircase there. This will be a good one. <laughs> Instead, there's a home invasion that happens. And so the this uh, this woman who has this ocular problem is now depending on the other person on the other end of the app who is okay. seen for her and 
Um, you know, it like uh, the, the premise is not a bad one. It's just no, it actually sounds could be like it could be interesting. Yeah, and I, at the end of the day, I don't think it's a terrible movie, but it just doesn't do anything new or different with the premise. And there are so many better versions of this. Mm-hmm. The one thing I did like about the movie is that the the main character. Uh, played by Skylar Davenport, is a little bit morally ambiguous. Like, she's not necessarily a, a a super good person. And not just because she's, you know, it's not, uh like, set of a woman where she's just, like, blind and ornery. Mm-hmm. Uh, although, oh, wow. that would be, now that I say <laughs> that, the better movie is the colonel from set of a woman in this scenario. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to break into my house, I'll burn it down. Hua, much better movie. You remind me of Seth Meyers doing Al Pacino. It's I, my uh, like it, you don't remind me of Al Pacino. You remind me of Seth Meyers doing Al Pacino. It's uh, like the impression I do of Al Pacino is the impression everyone does of Al uh, of Al Pacino, right? From the time that he did Sin of a Woman on. <laughs> and yeah isn't it weird he had such an illustrious career prior to that only when it comes time for someone to do an impression of him they forget all of that and they go straight for sin of a woman well yeah because that's when he started doing an impression of himself uh, yes because yes. before like in godfather and stuff it's a very like that's that's my family Kay. that's not me like it's a very state right it's a very mm. uh a, a very normal voice a little high-pitched even even you know stuff like uh, cruising and all of that, but mm-hmm. yeah, as soon as he hit "Son of a Woman," and I think it's because he won an Oscar, and he was like, "I guess that means I don't have to act anymore." Wow! <laughs> and and every role that he's been in since "Son of a Woman" has just been that. Um, but <laughs> I do think it would be great if he were in this movie. Um, but yeah, it's. It's kind of fine, but it's more disappointing because it's just kind of fine. Um, yeah. When there are just so many, you know, we talked about Wait Until Dark and Hush and uh, what? what's another good example of one of these movies? Or Don't Breathe. Even Blink, I think, was, it was not bad. Are you, you talking about the one? Madeline Stowe, Ed Harris movie, Blink? Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, actually, it was Matt, was Ed Harris in it? I know the lead was um, oh Benny and June brother, oh. Johnny Depp. <laughs> no. Oh, uh, Aiden Quinn. Aiden Quinn. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Um, yes. no, you're right. You're right. Eddie, Ed Harris was not in it. Aiden Quinn was. James Remar was in that. Yes. Yeah. Laurie Metcalf. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. I <laughs> blink. From 1993, a movie that is now 30 years old, if you want to uh, feel ancient. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. But, so, or, uh, what is, speaking of, uh, Pacino, didn't he do another one with somebody who was, or maybe I'm thinking of Copycat, where Sigourney Weaver just couldn't leave her house. Whatever. Uh, I watched that not too long ago, um, because we're in our seas, and that was actually, that was better than I remember, too. People give that movie a lot of shit. I didn't think it was all that bad. Yeah, it's it okay. Now, har, 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 uh, har, Go on. What the fuck? What's his name? Sound um, it out. It's like Mel Tillis. Just sing it. S- <laughs> <laughs> Copycat. Oh, okay. 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 I love that you fucking went for Mel Tillis. <laughs> because only you <laughs> would, would pull Mel Tillis out of your ass. Uh-huh. And I love it. Uh, knowing damn well that I'm probably the only person that knows who the hell you're talking about. Yeah, I'm going to have to put in the podcast notes, like, here, here's a link <laughs> to the Mel Tillis Wikipedia page. <laughs> m- m- man Potter cannot King. live by b- bread alone. <laughs> um, it's... <laughs> <laughs> he has his whole foghorn leghorn thing going. Uh-huh. Uh, Harry Connick Jr. is what I was going to say. His um his performance is a little over the top. He's a you little, think? He's, he's a little nuts. He's but a... it was fun. It's a fun movie. He goes a little broad. <laughs> <laughs> a 
pl- play it for the back of the room. <laughs> um, but I don't Give me disagree. Your <laughs> <laughs> I like I, I I enjoy the movie copy, but it's mostly because it's Holly Hunter and Sigourney Weaver together. Yeah, and I have a crush on both of them, and you put them together in a movie, and I'm you know just just try to keep my hands out of my pants. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's C for me is uh, okay. the point. What? <laughs> well, you you want to hear about something good? Yes, please. Too bad. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> too bad because the next thing I have is not bad. It is. It is. Now you know how you've been waiting all of these years for a true sequel to <laughs> I Spit on Your Grave. Oh you know yeah, yeah, have. yeah. There's a, yeah. <laughs> what what is the name of this thing? I spit on your grave. Deja vu. Deja vu. That's right. Okay. And yeah, it actually has. Um, oh, what is her name? Um, who plays Jennifer? I don't remember her name. Um, I'll look it up. You keep going. From the from the uh, anyway from the original film, she comes back, and she and her daughter get um, kidnapped outside this restaurant because she's written a book. Uh, she's written a book about her, uh, all, you know, what she went through back then. And she's also been, uh, she gets a lot of hate because of it. People call her a murderer and all this stuff. And so she's constantly having to defend the fact that she did what she did. And so she wrote this book and then she and her daughter get kidnapped. And it turns out they're kidnapped by the wife, which is really hard to believe, but okay um the wife of the main guy that she killed and the father of the um the matthew and then i think it's the brother he's supposed to be the younger brother of one of the other guys and i'm like this was fucking 50 years ago Mm -hmm. like and this brother is like 20 like how does that work but anyway uh they kidnap her and they want to get revenge you know so it the the premise itself is not bad if you want to make if you want to have a reason to bring this character back and do something with it this many years later i I think that that is an okay jumping off point the problem is the movie is almost three hours long what yes it is two hours and 50 minutes long and the majority of that is bullshit shitty dialogue because every single character has to go on this diatribe for like 10 to 15 minutes about everything they do. And I'm like, shut up, shut up. You know, like I've just, it's, it's just, you need an editor, sir. That's exactly what you need. But beyond that, I didn't hate it. I gave it like a two. I, I didn't, I just didn't, you know, I didn't like it, but I could kind of see what he was trying to do. What really disappointed me was that her daughter who oh and they did that whole thing from birdemic uh, where um the her daughter is she even she says like exactly this pretty much you are talk she's talking jennifer's talking to her daughter you are the most or you are the highest paid supermodel in the world and you're the most sought after and then you look at this woman and you go yeah, okay um <laughs> but hey, it's all attitude it's, jamie it's just like in Birdemic, you know, where he sells millions of dollars of 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 sunlight. It's one one what million is dollars. He is going to sell yes. his company for yes. one million dollars. <laughs> one million dollars because he it was two million and he gave the guy fifty yeah. percent off. And I'm like, what? All right, how did you not lose your job? Um, okay. Camille Keaton, um, by the way, is the oh, the actress you. who played Jennifer in yes. both both of these movies. But yes, um. And uh, anyway, so her daughter's supposed to be this most famous, highest paid supermodel in the world, and she gets kidnapped with him. The thing I have a problem with uh, the most, apart from the fact that it's almost three fucking hours long, is that, and it's one of those movies where Brian wanted to stop. Like, he was, we're probably 30 minutes in, and he's like, I don't need to finish this movie. And he actually (laughs) got it for, he got it for review. Uh, He didn't ask for it. They just sent it to him. And He's like, I really don't need to see anymore. And I'm like, well, I'm in it now. I have to know the end. And he's like, oh, yeah, okay. So I end up sticking it out for the end. And he, 
<laughs> then he see, <laughs> he snatched the remote from me a couple times and fast forwarded through. And I was like, stop it. So we're like fighting over the remote. But anyway, the, the biggest problem I had with it is that they worked in a rape scene with the daughter for no reason other than to have a rape scene. And I have always been a staunch defender of the first film. I actually really like the first film. It's not a fun watch. It's it's a hard watch. But I always gave him credit in that I felt like he made it as brutal as he did so that by the time you got to the end of that film, no one on earth would blame her for what she did. You know, there's just, she did what she did because they fucking deserved it. Mm -hmm. And I have always been on board with that. And I'm like, you know, sometimes you got to sit through the hard shit and it's for a good reason. And I, I've always felt that way about the first one. And I have always defended it. This one, I have zero defense, zero. This, this rape scene was totally unnecessary. It meant nothing. It led to nothing. I mean, it did lead to her getting revenge, but she got revenge because they killed her mother. They cut, they cut Camille Keaton's head off on the, the steps of a church. Like, I, that is enough. That, that right there is enough for you to go out and get your revenge. You know, we didn't need this other, and Brian's like, well, what's the difference? And I'm like, the difference is in the first one, that was the reason she was getting her revenge. We had to be on her side. We had to feel what she felt. It needed to be that brutal. And I'm okay with that. With this one, you could have cut it out completely and her motivation wouldn't have changed. So it's totally unnecessary. And he's like, yeah, you may, and he's like, yeah, you're right. And I'm like, apart from that, it's three hours long mm. and it's, you don't need it. Like, don't do it. Don't waste your time. And I, it, I, it hurts my feelings to say so. But even on top of that, the performances aren't very good. The dialogue is terrible. It's, it's just, it is a, hey, everybody else is bringing back their legacy characters. I want to do that too. That's exactly what this is. And it is a pure cash in and he didn't have the decency to even try to come up with something that wasn't pure exploitation, which is what, this, and I don't have a problem with exploitation, but I'm like, don't follow a film that, you know, like the first one that actually has an impact, I think, with something that is so hollow and so obvious in the fact that you don't give a shit about it. You're just... I don't know. It, it just, it's not good. Not good. I was really just, I was almost angry. <laughs> yeah. And that takes a lot. You that, know? That's a real bummer because there is something about the original I Spit on Your Grave that, I, you know, still to this day feels like transgressive and, yes. um, y you know, I've, I've been reading Men, Women, and Chainsaws recently. Uh-huh. I've read it. And well, okay, so there there is a lot of discussion in that book about uh, about I spit on your grave as being the, mm -hmm. this kind of interesting, you, you know, uh, gender study of how like this movie does not show the rape for titillation or anything or the original I spit on your grave that is very much like making men live with the brutality of that as, as viewers in the audience, which isn't always the case. You know, a lot of times rape scenes and films are shown with a degree of titillation and I spit on your grave. is not like that at all. And no, I mean, it's dirty. I mean, like physically dirt, like there's, you know, she's dirty. <laughs> like there's, it's dirty and vile and violent and there is nothing exciting or attractive or or titillating about it. Like it is, it is, it just reaches down into your gut to where I don't know. Uh, it, it, it grabs a hold of you, or at least for me. And when I was younger, it didn't do that uh, as much. Like I watched the film, and I always liked it, but I liked the revenge aspect of it. As I got older, and I was able to more. Uh, I don't know, process it with a more adult mind, I guess, exactly how harrowing what she was going through was and how evil everything they did was, then it had a much deeper impact on me. And the more I watch it, like every single time, I, and it's not something I watch every year, it's been a couple of years since I've seen it, but 
every time I do watch it, it gets a little worse. You know, it gets harder to watch because I just am like, oh God, it is just brutal, brutal. But there's nothing sexy about it. You know, he's not, I never got the impression that he was trying to make it hot. You know, he's not, this isn't for fun. This is, yeah, I I think that you go with the understanding that women kind of get how horrifying the idea is and that this was to make sure everyone got it everyone can see how just how depraved this all is and i felt like he had a real solid point that he was trying to drive Mm -hmm. and yeah so it's it's disappointing to hear that this sounds like it kind of you know un unspools some of what made the original so interesting and and worthy of discussion and why it's a movie that people still, I mean, it's a grindhouse movie, but there seems to be enough substance to it. Um, so anyway, it's, uh, interesting. Um, uh, to say the least that, you know, this movie 40 years on is kind of a whole lot of nothing. Um, Hey, you, you want to hear about one last movie? Uh, uh, do you want to hear a good one? Yes. Too bad. I've not done much of that. <laughs> Jamie. Oh, you got me. <laughs> what's good for the goose is good for the ganda. Um, I saw on Netflix a movie called Choose or Die. Oh, I saw the trailer for that. Oh, no. It was, you know how when you turn on Netflix, there's always that one in the background that pops up and it kind of gives you the little rundown or the it starts playing a little bit. Mm-hmm. I saw that. That's as far as I've seen. But. Yeah. So I know I know what it's about. So Yeah. So um don't watch any more than what you've seen already. <laughs> Damn, I almost because when I saw that, I was like, well, you know, I'd give that a shot. Uh don't. Oh. It is filled with British actors being Americans. And that is you know, of of differing success uh as the movie goes on um but it's it's one of the like i'm kind of a sucker for the idea of like oh this video game is haunted and if you die in the game you die for real and this isn't that this is more hey there's this text-based game and it gives you two options and you got to pick something but it's a real you know monkey's paw kind of choice because even if you pick the thing that doesn't sound so bad it's going to end up bad for somebody Okay. And then once you kind of get the, like, here's what's going on. Um, and I won't spoil it here just in case somebody does want to watch it. Don't. Because when you get the revelation of, okay, here's, here is why this game is trying to make you choose. It is such a clear setup for a sequel. That doesn't pay off. Like it ends in a real, like, well, perhaps next time we'll do battle with each other kind of thing. Oh. And you're like, I don't think so. You can, here's what you can do. You can pack all of that up into a big box and mail it to, to Timbuktu and then follow it. Because I don't want any part <laughs> of another choose or die movie. The, the original uh, that, that and, and the other thing that, that I was thinking about when, when it comes to all this netflix choose or die thing is that this was the second and at least i think it's the second movie in a row that netflix has produced or or been an exclusive netflix horror movie that has just been a complete and total misfire like the the one before it is that texas chainsaw massacre movie where i i loved it but I I mean somebody's got to I guess. <laughs> but I was like, "Oh yeah, so what if that Halloween remake only with Texas Chainsaw Massacre and influencers?" Yeah, now th- when you say it like that. <laughs> I mean, but that's what it is. <laughs> no, yeah, I know. They're really they were trying to do the well, it is just like with the I spit on your grave. He really just they really just tried to shoehorn in Sally Hardesty and mm-hmm. 
that part was not so successful. Now, I don't blame the actress. I think the actress was fine. She did what she could, and but there just was nothing for her to do there, you know, which is, you know, that's that's disappointing. I do, one thing I do like about that movie, though, is that I think they subvert your expectations when you first meet the cowboy. He comes off like a prick, and then it turns out, like, he's a, a really good guy, and he actually is my favorite character, uh, one of my favorite characters of the year so far. I love him. But, uh, and then you get the the whole, the influencers, or uh, they are what you expect them to be, but I just thought the movie was fun. Like, I, we have, we don't get Texas Chainsaw movies with that kind of just balls-to-the-wall violence, and, and that mean like the bus scene kill. Mm-hmm. As as much as it makes me cringe when the guy's like, you know, try anything and you're canceled, bro. Uh, when he then proceeds to just mow down everybody in that bus, just limbs flying and blood flying. I was having a good time. So. Yeah, but you have to hear somebody say, try anything and you're canceled. To yeah. get to get to the violence and it's not <laughs> worth it. <laughs> like every, every uh, yeah, I Again, I you know like what you like. I am not telling you you're wrong. I've seen it three times. <laughs> but when I got done watching that movie, I was like, "Oh, go fuck myself." Okay, <laughs> this this movie is so stupid. <laughs> and you're right; it's violent and it's gory. And if that's what you're in for, like if that's the only thing you want out of the movie, then it'll give that to you. But l- Everything else about the movie is not great. And Choose or Die, <laughs> but I will say this, Choose or Die is that dumb, only it doesn't have the gore. Oh, well, then there's no point. Uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> that, <laughs> He's like, hey, you got it. That That's is what I was trying to say. A hundred percent correct. <laughs> So, um, anyway, that is a final. We, we, we've hit our hour mark, and as always... We, we try to keep, keep these things yeah. limited to an hour, but, um, you know, we, uh, we covered some good ground and I, I, I think that, you know, people have learned a lot of valuable lessons, mostly about what not to see. Yeah. And that army, army is <laughs> army, it's army. So bad. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, we'll be back in a month. (laughs) 